preview and predictions here on MMA World. I will be your host this afternoon, and I will have my co-host Kayla joining me shortly here. We're going to go over the main card here for UFC 217, which is going to be this weekend from Madison Square Garden, live on pay-per-view, also prelims on FS1, as well as early prelims on UFC. And this is arguably the biggest event of the year for the Ultimate Fighting Championship, as three championships will be decided here from Madison Square Garden. Once again, I'm your host, Jim Graham, coming to you live here on MMA World, and glad to have you on the broadcast watching this afternoon or evening or wherever you may be viewing from. And of course, uh, as always, you can always comment below with any questions, comments, or concerns uh, about this cards, and we'll do our best to get to them uh, in the meantime. So let me bring on my co-host, Kayla Beatty. And hello, how are you this afternoon, Kayla? Hey, Jim, how are you? I'm great. I'm Sorry, doing good as adjusted. well. Yeah. All right. We're, as, <laughs> nice as to a, meet you. Yeah. And, yeah. And as I was telling everybody, we're going to talk about UFC 217 here on the program. Uh, before we get to the main card, I want to highlight uh, the undercard. Very good undercard as far as undercards go. Yeah. And when we were um, going over this undercard, and some of the things I was looking at, I kind of have a little bit of a cheat. I know I said uh, on the show notes that we would each pick one fight we're excited to. I have a little bit of a cheat, I will admit. Because um, <laughs> the fight I'm most interested to see is Mickey Gall against Randy Brown. That's the Both one I chose, guys. too. Yeah, that's the <laughs> fight I, I, I want to see the most. So I'll get your thoughts on that here in just a minute. But the guy I want to see the most, the fighter I want to see the most is, um, where did he go? He was right here on my screen. Uh, oh, uh, Mr. Ian Kutalibre, who is an absolute just animal uh, coming out of officially Moldova. I think he also uh, has done some in um, the Ukraine. Um, this guy is, is a beast. I don't know, just his attitude, just the way he approaches this game. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen quite someone bring that quite type of intensity to the octagon before. Uh, and he, he is just fun to watch. I mean, his nickname's the Hulk. He, he <laughs> certainly is a very angry individual when he enters the cage. So that's, that's my cheat. And that's who I'm very interested to see. Cause I don't know a lot about his opponent coming out of Poland. Uh, some of you can see a little bit of the Polish flag in the back here. So I apologize. This is, I don't know Polish, but M Michael Oleszynskichuk probably said that completely wrong, that was, but that's who Kucha Libre that's is <laughs> taking on. But that's, that's my cheat, Kayla. Uh, do you have any cheat like that? Um, no, well, you know, the fight that I was really, if we were going to talk about prelims and pick one, just because, like you said, it's so stacked. Yeah, I'm really excited about the Randy Brown and Mickey Gall, just because they're both, they've both been picked off of looking for a fight. They're obviously that new young blood, um, you know, hungry, hungry guys to get in there. They both have a boxing background, actually, the more I looked into it. Um, so they're, they have that in common, but then at the same time, we're also working with a knockout artist in Randy Brown. And, you know, some submission specialists with Mickey Gall. So, you know, both of them have had um, a couple fights where they've gotten to showcase a little bit about what they can do. And, and I think most of their fights uh, ended pretty early. So I'm just excited to see maybe two guys that are in that same level, whether it be that they're just, you know, coming into the game and, and still that fresh new meat or that they do have similarities within their styles. I'm excited to see who comes out a winner there and what they can show us. Cause obviously opening a prelims is a good opportunity. Yeah. And especially for Mickey Gall, a guy who hasn't fought in quite a while either. Um, mm -hmm. He hasn't fought since defeating Sage Northcutt. And that was all the way in December of last year. So it's nearly a year since we've seen Mickey Gall inside the UFC, uh, a fight where he was kind of losing against Sage Northcutt, but he was able to land a, a kind of a crazy haymaker, which got the fight into his realm, the jiu-jitsu realm, where he is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, brown belt, 
uh, very yeah. close to being a black belt, and he was able to take out the much less experienced ground fighter. Now he's taking a guy in Randy Brown who does have some grappling, obviously tremendous power as well. Five of his nine victories are by knockouts and is also probably one of the few guys that is just as big as Mickey Gall too. Mickey yeah. Gall stands, uh, you know, he's about six foot. He's a pretty big welterweight, even though he's expressed some interest in dropping to 155. And then you look at the other side of Randy Brown. This dude's six two. This dude's a huge welterweight. This guy's massive. So, It'll be interesting to see how he'll be able to deal with a guy that's really big and strong like Randy Brown. And obviously a guy would say as of right now and from what we've seen of both fighters in so far in the UFC is a better striker. Yeah, and I think you make a good point there. You know, if we're going to talk, I don't know if we're making predictions, but um, just to throw my two cents with that. And I also want to say hi to all my friends that just started joining and watching. I appreciate your support. Thanks for watching, guys. Um, yeah, I think that that's probably, if I'm going to choose a fighter, I probably would favor Randy Brown just because, like you said, I think that his size um, might be the, the key reason of to why he wins. It might be harder for Mickey Gall to necessarily get him on the ground and use that grappling and use that ground game. So I, I just, I'm favoring Randy Brown in the sense that he is the bigger guy, maybe a more powerful guy. Um, so I'm, I'm predicting kind of an earlier earlier finish in the rounds do you have a prediction for this fight i don't know if it's just the uh the jujitsu guy in me training now but <laughs> yeah. i i actually i like mickey gall in this matchup because even if randy brown knocks him down that's getting into mickey gall's realm and also even though he's been away 11 months i haven't heard of mickey gall getting injured so i don't think it i think he's really been working on his game and that's just to say randy brown hasn't but I think Randy Brown, as far as you look at guys that are very similar in their career, I would say when you look at like prospects, I would say Randy Brown's not a finished prospect, but I said he's closer to being a finished product than Mickey Gall is mm. because Mickey Gall is almost a pure jujitsu guy. So to me, the, the upside for Mickey Gall, it's already looked pretty good. Four victories, four submissions. I mean, you can't get much better than that. So I think he has a little bigger upside right now just because he is so young and has so much more to learn. Whereas Randy Brown, I think, really is just about him getting better at a skill set that's already good, just refining that skill set instead of learning a new skill set, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it totally does. I think that's just the most exciting thing about this matchup. Both guys have a lot to prove. They obviously want to stand out to move up amongst the rankings. So hopefully we'll get at least a submission or a knockout finish with this one. That's what I'm, I'm hoping for. I think it will be a finish. I mean, uh only one win of Randy Brown has gone to decision and Mickey Gall's never gone to decision as a pro. So Working I was pretty, pretty good odds. <laughs> All right, let's get to the main card though. Kayla, we're kicking off uh, the main card here with former welterweight champion, Johnny Hendricks, once again, fighting in the middleweight division. And he's taking on one of the young up and comers in the division, Paula Costo, AKA uh, Borciana. And this dude so far has proven that he's just an absolute monster. He comes mm -hmm. right at you. He's throwing super hard punches right out of the gate. However, he is taking on a guy that is arguably the most accomplished amateur wrestler ever in UFC history in Johnny Hendricks, a guy who was a national champion wrestler at Oklahoma State University. Now, the biggest thing is obviously this fight's not at 170 pounds. It's at mm -hmm. 185 pounds. And so far, since being forced up to 185, Johnny Hendricks has not fared very well. His last fight against Tim Bosch in his kind of hometown there uh, in Oklahoma City looked awful. And how, But the other side of that, Paul Acosta is not Tim Bosch. He's not a guy that was also All-American wrestler. This guy is almost a pure striker. So that could give Hendricks a lot better opportunity uh, to win a fight at 185 because he's not dealing with a guy that can kind of cancel out his wrestling skills. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I think too, you know, with Paolo, a lot of his finish or a lot of his fights haven't gone too far into the rounds either, at least within the UFC from what I'm looking at. And I think really it's again, going to be, you know, this young guy versus someone with experience with Johnny Hendricks. Um, I'm actually really happy to see where his mindset is at during fight week just from how he's been acting in media. I think for a while there, he was, um, it was more just his mental game was, was fighting against him. Um, you know, obviously he had trouble missing weight, was trying to kind of figure out where he was going to fall out, whether, which division. And 
from what I'm seeing in interviews, it just seems like his head's finally in the right space. So I think that will definitely be a big factor to play in where we might see some of that old Johnny Hendricks that we know and love and some of those old skills. And I don't think that he's sleeping on his opponent either. Um, so, yeah, I'm just excited <laughs> one, to see him perform and just have a better mindset, clear mindset, and be able to showcase that wrestling. I think, like you said, he, you know, he especially, too, really needs a win. Obviously, Paolo wants to take on a, a former, um, you know, top contender and make a statement with that. But Johnny Hendricks really needs this win. So I think that he's going into this fight just uh, with that better mindset, not going to really take any chances of standing up and striking with a striker. I feel like we'll see him take this to the ground. Yeah, I think Johnny Hendricks, this might be kind of a do or die fight for him. Because if he loses Perfect. this fight, this will be losing five out of his last six fights. His lone victory coming over another guy, who had trouble making 170 and Hector Lombard. Mm -hmm. So it's not like he beat somebody that's, you know, I hate to say a legit middleweight, but a guy that's also kind of on the downside of his career too. This is not Hector Lombard that was running through guys in Bellator and won like 18 fights in a row. This mm -hmm. is a completely different guy. So if Johnny Hendricks loses to this young up and comer, you got to start looking at one retirement because it's just not working out or two getting cut from the UFC and, you know, maybe fighting for Bellator or Risen or right. some of these other organizations. This is a really big fight for him. And the UFC is kind of kind of sticking with him a little bit because they're giving him a main card slot. We mentioned the, how many great fights are on here. I mean, you have a guy like OSP who just headlined a card in Japan, and he's fighting on Fight Pass. It's right. not like they, had, uh -huh. like they didn't have options for this opening card, and they chose to give it to Johnny Hendricks. So they're putting a lot of faith that he can go in there and get it done and look like a world champion. So to me, there's a lot of pressure here on Johnny Hendricks. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And that was something that I found so interesting, too. I'm glad you brought that up. He's just been fighting so often. And that, you know, I, ha I host a uh, co-host a radio show with my friend Gabriel, and we've talked about this throughout the last few months. Where is his mindset at? Like, can someone talk to him and just see, is it out of desperation that he's fighting so often? I just think that, you know, and then it, it was confusing because, like you're saying, the UFC was giving him these big fights on big fight cards. So there must be some discussion behind closed doors where they feel like he can still, you know, be a top contender, at least take on some of these guys and compete in the UFC. But I think, like you said, this is definitely his uh, do or die fight. And, and But he knows that. Really, if you watch his interviews this week, he looks like a completely different guy than what we've seen over the last six to eight months. All right, we'll do our, all the predictions for the main card at the end, just in case um, okay. that was going there. So, and what we're uh, looking at here is um, we're looking at the next fight. Uh, sorry, there's some messages were popping up in comments and stuff. So, oh yes, we do have um, to interact with people. Let's see. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, it looks like there's some digital hey, connection problems. Uh, it may appear so. I think most most people are able to watch us, but um, we're moving on here to the second fight, which is Stephen Thompson against uh, Jorge Masvidal. And so this excited fight, about this one! Yeah, this is a huge matchup at 170 pounds. The winner uh, has already been announced; will get a shot um, at the welterweight champion, I believe. Uh, especially if Masvidal wins. I don't know about. Um, Stephen Thompson. Yeah, so, this is an interesting one. It, it's definitely very interesting because I know Robbie Lawler's also in the mix as well. Um, but looking at this matchup, you have a guy that's very technical and you have a guy that's kind of not quite a brawler, technical brawler, I guess you could say. In Just that's or unorthodox striking. Yeah, and he also yeah. does have a good, he does have a good ground game as well. Um, he's very tough to take down. Mm -hmm. And he, even though he's not a black belt in jiu-jitsu, I mean, he just went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Damian Maya, got in some precarious situations, and was still able to survive. And obviously, Stephen Thompson does not have any of that. Mm -hmm. So you have to give the ground edge to Jorge Masvidal. And the striking edge, I think, stylistically, Stephen Thompson's probably overall the better striker. But for MMA, uh, Jorge Masvidal, I think, has a very aggressive style. Um, he And has a very tough guy to finish. He's, I don't think, ever been finished. Mm -hmm. um, in his career, or well, it's been several years since he's been finished his career. He's a very hard, tough guy to knock out. And if you look at Thompson's losses, well, one of the losses anyway is was to Matt Brown. And mm -hmm. at that time, Matt Brown 
was a very aggressive guy who came right after Stephen Thompson. And Stephen Thompson really had trouble dealing with a guy coming right after him, a guy that wasn't allowing him to get that space to throw right. off those spinning attacks. And I think Masvidal is a guy that can implement that type of same game plan. And if that if that's the case, Thompson's going to be in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, no, you make some great points there. And I think it, what's so cool about martial arts to me, and especially, you know, with these fights and at UFC caliber, with each fight, whether they win or lose, just even preparing and training for certain fighters like a Cowboy Cerrone or like a Damien Maya, you're going to – of course, just refreshing up or, or better your skills. And I think that now, especially preparing for someone like Damien Maya, like you said, holding his own for most of the fight, I'm sure he has a whole other level of confidence with his ground game that maybe Stephen Wonderboy Thompson doesn't have. The other thing I found interesting when looking at this fight is their reach and height isn't actually that different. Usually Stephen Thompson has that you know, reach or space, you know, distance um, advantage. And I think from what I looked at, they don't have that much of a difference in, um, in the reach. And I think, like you said, Jorge Masvidal is just someone that is known for his unorthodox striking, for putting on that pressure. He's brought those backyard brawls and that whole, I guess, mentality or, or you know, fight skill into the <laughs> UFC. And I think, like you said, when we've seen someone like Stephen Thompson, who's fought the champ, uh, Tyron Woodley, and obviously we know that, especially within their last fight, people were complaining that he just couldn't get it started fast enough, that um, he was pacing way too long within the fight, um, not pulling the trigger. And I think that uh, Jorge Masvidal is going to not allow that to happen. He's going to put that pressure forward. And I just think that even though Stephen Wonderboy Thompson has obviously amazing striking capabilities, um, has that karate background, I think Jorge Masvidal, with his unorthodox striking and coming in from certain angles, I feel like I might be favoring him. But I'll wait until the end to give my final prediction. Yeah, and again, we apologize to anyone that's trying to watch on their uh, desktop or laptop. Apparently, there's some connection issues. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what's going on with that. But again, we apologize for the issues. But uh, for those of you watching uh, off the phone, app, uh, iPad, all that good stuff, um, Thank you for sticking with us, and it seems to be working fine, so I'm not really sure what is going on. So I think you can still hear the audio on the desktop. If so, if you can switch over to the app, uh, you'll be able to see us clearly. Um, apparently having Sorry about that some guy. connection. So, um, yeah, but, but this fight right here, like you said, um, Stephen Thompson, I feel like what he has to do best is be able to create space. He really has to work his angles because Jorge Masvidal is a guy that's not going to sit back and let him do all this mystical magic and stuff. And if he can create that space or figure out how to counter when uh, Masvidal comes mm. inside, I think it's going to be uh, excellent uh, for Steven Thompson. But if not, if he can't figure out how to counter that, it could end up being uh, a short night uh, for Steven Thompson uh, because Masvidal has proven even up the weight class, he definitely has power to knock people out. Mm -hmm, for sure. Should we answer? We have two questions. They're pretty interesting. I feel like maybe we can take a quick break from. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's get let's go. Let's take a couple of questions here. So if someone's asking what we think of Darren Till, badass former ch or new champion in the making. That's what I think. I was. I'll admit, I didn't think Darren Till could be Don Cerrone, and I know a lot of we have a lot of UK viewers, and that's probably not a very popular opinion, but I. <laughs> I'm being honest, honest, I didn't think he could beat Donald Cerrone, let alone knock him out in the first round. So the fact that he was able to do that, uh, I think is very impressive. I think the sky's the limit uh, for him. I think he is the hottest prospect in the 170 division. I think he has proven that. I mean, we talked about Randy Brown and Mickey Gall earlier, but Darren Till is ahead of both those gentlemen. He's, you know, he's ahead of Sage Northcutt. You know, he, anyone else you can think of in the 170 division, he's ahead of right now. Um, and he's and typically in the UFC, you either rise to a championship level quickly or you typically never get there. And Darren Till is a guy that seems to be rising to that championship level very quickly. Uh, and I think he is prime for a big time fight coming up. Not to say Don Cerrone was a small fight, but I mean, something bigger than made of ending a fight pass card. Um, I think that's very likely happening. Obviously, the UFC just announced they're doing an event in London in March. Mm -hmm. I, was gonna I say, would yeah. add he's a very likely candidate uh, to be on that card. 
No, I agree. I, I can definitely see him having a big fight on that card. And I think just to kind of back up what you're saying, he's just such a great example of how you get it done coming in as a new prospect, taking on a challenging fight like a Donald Cerrone and just having such good composure in there, having a great game plan and showing your skills. And now we can't, obviously everyone wants to talk about him. Someone else is asking what our favorite flavor crisps are. Uh, for those in America, that's potato chips. Uh, <laughs> uh, mine are, there's a company here in Michigan. I don't know if you can get them everywhere in the United States, but for certainly here in Michigan called Better Made, and they make an amazing brand of barbecue chips. So it's Better Made uh, barbecue chips. Uh, Ooh, well. I'll try those. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually, chips are one of my favorite snacks. And I'm also a barbecue girl most days, but every once in a while, I just crave like a flaming hot Cheeto when I'm feeling spicy. Okay. And then uh, this is another question from Lewis. How is my Brazilian jiu-jitsu? So far, pretty good. I mean, not <laughs> great, but um, it's pretty good for a guy who's been in it for two months, I would say. <laughs> uh, good for you. That, good. Um, and then thanks. Uh, Jay we had uh, James with the question about Darren Till. And then uh, we have a question from Joe. Um, if Bisbang beats GSP, will he be the GOAT? No. No, yeah. beating a guy beating a guy who comes from a smaller weight class off a of four year layoff does not make you the greatest of all time. I agree. There's just too many <laughs> other people. You know, I mean Bisping Bisping already has, in my opinion, a legacy within him, himself of what he's creating and building. Um, even the business side of it too, how he's marketed himself and, and opened up other opportunities. But I don't think that this one win, especially for the reasons that you just said, a, a guy that's coming out of his normal weight class and been on such a, you know, um, on hold for four years. I don't think that this one fight is going to make him the go. Not with right. Ioana and Demetrius out there. Right. right. <laughs> and speaking of Ioana, she is trying to defend her title once again, this time against Thug Rose, Nama Yunez. If Ioana is successful, it will tie Ronda Rousey's record for most female fight, title defenses in the Ultimate Fighting Championship. And uh, this is me just speculating, but if she's victorious, her next fight will be to break the record in Poland. That's, I, I think it has to be, uh, considering how KSW broke the UFC's attendance record uh, in Poland. Mm. I, I think they kind of have an ax to grind, and I think putting Joanna in her home country, they could possibly break that record even in the same stadium. That's, that's me just... That's that's just the fanboy theory. That's not something <laughs> concrete, but I think I think that's a very likely scenario. Yeah, no, I agree. I think a lot of people were surprised or disappointed that she wasn't even that what she wasn't headlining that last card. But obviously, due to scheduling and that she wanted to jump on this MSG card, saw a big opportunity there. Um, you know, it didn't work out. But I completely agree. I could see, especially something that would mean so much to her of of breaking that record. Why not do it in your home? hometown home home country and there's already been two cards in poland and no joanna yajacek mm -hmm. so that too all right let's get to the fight though so far joanna yajacek has been dominant 14 and 0 so far in her career other than i would really say the first fight with claudia gadelia no one has coming close to touching the woman from poland you and don't think carolina no that she <laughs> yeah she landed one punch I, I hate to say it was a fluke but she landed one punch that kind of rocked her in the fourth round of a fight that she got dominated in okay. uh now that's not to say a rematch will go exactly the same way but in my opinion i mean she clearly won four out of those five rounds um other than that fight now where rose is going to be tricky is i think she's going to be one of the few girls that are as just as tall as joanna which mm -hmm. so far in her career she's mostly taken on girls shorter than her and also ha i mean these got girls are almost the exact same height and exact same reach according to the ufc website they're both five six and they both have uh, about a five six reach at wingspan too um so i think that's going to be interesting for Ioana. she hasn't had to deal with that as a mixed martial artist now she probably had to deal with that as a kickboxer as we right. all know, she did take on Valentina Shevchenko in, in Muay Thai. So uh, she hasn't had to do that for a while. So I think that's going to be an interesting concept, too. And three uh, two, three would be the submission and scrambling game, which is, I think, the X factor of this fight. If Rose can outwork, out-hustle Ioana in those 50-50 positions and get them to an advantageous position for her, that's, to me, how she can win this fight. Because if she stands at range 
she will lose. If it gets into the, a clinch, I still, I still think Ioana with, with her skills. She has to get the fight here. She has to do, I think, what Damian Maya was unwilling to do against Tyron Woodley and go crazy, pull guard, try yeah. takedowns from different angles. Don't just do the same wrestling double leg. And not and the, the reason I think it'll work is because Rose, unlike Damian Maya, I don't think is afraid to get hit. And I think that's a right. huge factor in this fight. And also got to factor in, you want to Jason, it doesn't hit like Tyron Woodley. So as much as I like <laughs> to say Damian Maya should have done this, I wouldn't want to get hit by Tyron Woodley either. Yoana, even though as dominant as she been, she hasn't put a lot of people away. So that may allow some more riskier things by someone like a Rose Namunas to possibly work because she's not one hitting quitting people. And that's a huge um, helpful factor for Rose trying to beat what so far has been unbeatable in 14 fights. Jim, I completely feel everything you're saying right now. It's so true. I think that Rose, because of her, I guess, willingness to take those chances and not be afraid to get hit and has kind of those, um, although Joanna just said in the press conference that she has some aces in her back pocket, I think Rose has those too with we, she's already been known for pulling off, you know, f um, flying arm bars and crazy submissions and trying, trying different things or gutsier things. And I think, like you said, just to, she knows she is not going to win if she stands up and strikes with Ioana. So to, like you said, come in with different angles and try and get, pull off different submissions from, you know, I guess, because we know Ioana has that takedown defense that's, that's pretty high. I don't remember the statistic of it, but yeah, it's, I'll see if I can pull it She's up. She's someone hard to, to get down to the ground. So I think, like you said, she has to, um, you know, pull out something clever there. But just like you said, as far as size, too, we saw Rose just within her last fight. So dominant, a dominant performance over Michelle Watterson, who herself is one of the bigger girls in that division. And we saw that she was able to go in there and get her to the ground to outpower her and just kind of uh, stand up and bang, hey, Alice. Um, but yeah, so I definitely think that this is going to be Joanna's, um, you know, I guess hardest opponent up to date. I think there's a lot of pressure on her wanting to match that, um, record that she's trying to match with Ronda Rousey's. And I just think that it's, I, I'm actually predicting without giving my prediction of who's going to win. I actually think that this might be fight of the night. Uh, and according to fight metric, which is the official stats provider of the UFC, uh, Joanna has successfully defended 81% of takedowns attempted against her. Um, and conversely, Rose Namajunas has only uh, landed 60% of the takedowns mm. that okay. she has attempted. So despite the grappling background, not necessarily super great at takedowns. Actually, Joanna, believe it or not, has a higher takedown percentage at 66% than Rose does. Wow. Now, course, Joanna probably has less attempts, but still. <laughs> no, that's true. I mean, the stats mean something. So, like I said, this is a situation where I think she has, to, like I said, has to pull guard, do some crazy things. The one of the best ways to beat someone that's been so dumb is to do things that you don't expect. And when you're the underdog, you ca you have nothing to lose. No, a lot of people are not expecting Rose Namajunas to win. So, really, mm -hmm. what's the difference whether you get knocked out? or you lose, or you get your butt whooped for 25 minutes. At the end of the day, it's an L, and you're not a champion. And people will praise you for going and taking those chances against Joanna. And like you said, I just, I don't see that in Rose. I think that she doesn't, she just seems real cool and just doesn't care if she, like you said, gets knocked out, submitted. So, I yeah, I think these girls are going to give us a brawl. I'm really excited about this one. All right, I want to get back to a comment here from Joe. He was the one that asked earlier uh, about, if uh, Bisbing would be the GOAT if he won. Mm -hmm. And he uh, answered back saying, how many people can say they've beaten Anderson Silva and GSP? I would say nobody, but you got to look at when he beat them. He didn't beat yeah. GSP in 2003, or 2003, 2013, or 2012. He didn't beat Anderson Silva in 2012. <laughs> he beat a 40-year-old former champion, Anderson Silva, and he would beat a 35-year-old former champion, GSP. I'm not dismissing the victories. I'm not saying they're worth nothing. But it's not like he fought those guys during his prime, uh, and especially the GSP one because it's up a weight class. I think yeah. you lose even more muster. Now, if Bisbing somehow could have got down to 170, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that as a high quality win all day. But at 185 pounds with GSP moving up, I don't consider that as big of a victory as it could be. 
if say like somebody like Jorge Masvidal or Steven Thompson beat GSP because that's at his weight class. It's at 170. Right. No, I completely agree. And I think that that's what this goat idea and who really takes that, you know, that title. It's so hard because it really just depends on what you consider, you know, being impressive wins, being impressive performances, records, what have you. But, but I agree. I think that to not that it isn't an accomplishment to beat someone like Anderson Silva and GSP, some of the greatest of all time, you uh, to be to take that title of of beating them and, and being called the greatest i think it has to be within their prime time too all right let's get to the next championship matchup cody garbrandt against tj dillashaw the grudge match Fire. be decided <laughs> here at madison square garden 11 and 0 cody garbrandt against the former champion and former training partner tj dillashaw and this is going to be, I think, one of the best fights technically you may ever see in the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Uh, Cody Garbrandt, to me, had one of the most perfect strategies in a championship fight when he took on Dominic Cruz. And I broke this down with one of my friends kind of after the fight. It's amazing how many fights it took someone to realize, let Dominic Cruz come to you instead of <laughs> yeah. you coming to Dominic Cruz. It's amazing how long it took for someone to come up with that strategy. But that's exactly what Cody did. He went right to the center of the octagon and just simply pivoted and let a guy who's very confident in striking from any angle come right at him. Uh -huh. And I don't, I don't know if Dominic Cruz figured that out with his coaching staff during the fight. It didn't seem like they did because they made no adjustments as the fight went on. They uh -huh. were allowing Cody to do that. And being a guy that's difficult to hit, maybe it was a point of pride thinking, oh, I'm going to be able to dodge everything this kid can throw at me because – what have I been doing for my whole career? Dodge everything, everyone. <laughs> His whole team. So, yeah. <laughs> but it didn't work out for him. Now he didn't get finished, but he came close. And I think that's because Cody was a little cocky. And I hope he doesn't do that against TJ Dillashaw because unlike Dominic Cruz, TJ Dillashaw has actually put people away in his career. He's not the decisionator. Right. Uh, TJ Dillashaw puts people away in his last four fights, three first round um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at Cody Garbrandt's. <laughs> in his last, um, you know, four fight, five fights, two of them being knockouts over Joe Soto and Hennem Brow. He had those like, loss to Dominic Cruz, and he had dominant victories to me in his rematch with Hans Rafael Asuncio, and completely washed out John Lineker. Mm -hmm. um, he is is primed, and I, I think, and, and also because he's 31, I, I hate to say like 31's an old guy, but with Cody being only, you know, 26 years old, this is, if the TJ Dillashaw is going to beat Cody Garbrandt, I think it has to be here because okay. to me, the, the, the gap of um, the two isn't that far skill wise, but Cody's starting to really enter his prime and right. TJ Dillashaw is going to be very close to exiting it. So to me, this is going to be, this is the opportunity for TJ to win. And I, I think that a lot is riding on this fight because if Cody loses, He's still only 26 years old. It's his first pro, pro loss, believe it or not. Yeah, it's crazy. It's time to come back and recapture the title. So to me, this is a very big fight for TJ Dillashaw. Yeah, I know you have made some great points there, and, and we're so lucky to get this fight, you know, like you said, just in the time frame that we are. And I think kind of what you're saying, it, I think it really is going to go down to whether or not they let the emotion and, and all of that bad blood um, you know, get in the mix there. And we have seen um, Cody, you know, kind of express that maybe not so much in fights, but obviously leading up to that Dominic Cruz fight, we saw that there are ways to get under his skin. And I think that when it comes down to it, I feel like Cody might have the upper hand as far as skill wise a little bit. And maybe it might just be that, you know, again, they've trained together. He's learned from TJ, but obviously learning from someone and then bringing in this like new evolved MMA fighter, I feel like he might have the upper hand, but I think where he could have some issues is like you said, if he starts getting too cocky, if he starts kind of letting that emotion get in the fight to where, Oh, I don't want to just beat TJ. I want to, you know, humiliate him for what he's done to our team. And then TJ capitalizing on that emotion and finding an opening to counter those uh, intentions and embarrass him right back. Now, I think the biggest X factor in this fight is going to be the wrestling of TJ Dillashaw. Now, Cody Garbrandt uh, was a very accomplished high school wrestler in Ohio, 
Um, but TJ Dillashaw, I know, did wrestle uh, collegiately. And so I would say as far as pure wrestling goes, you got to give a slight edge to TJ Dillashaw. Now, Dominic Cruz wasn't able to take down Cody Garbron, but that doesn't mean TJ Dillashaw can't. Uh, I would say TJ Dillashaw is more willing to kind of be a wrestler only mode than Dominic Cruz was. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's more, that's been more part of TJ Dillashaw's game. Uh, especially if you look at his bit days of the ultimate fighter, I think that's more ingrained in him than somebody like Dominic Cruz. So with that possibility, we may see TJ, I, I hate to say make it a boring fight, but I, I think maybe grind on Cody a lot more. He, I think that, that may be the key to his success is to really get in close in those tight situations and really make Cody work to get out and try to land some of those power punches. I think that even though he could probably dance with them, he could probably move around, make it a striking war. I really think TJ is going to bring the fight to Cody and try to really tie him up on the inside. I think that is going to be a good way to try to neutralize Cody Garbron because I think standing at range it seems as though he's figured out a great strategy how to do that and land power punches and be able to do it over 25 minutes mm-hmm. I know well hopefully hopefully we won't get 25 minutes of, of a boring fight but it, you make a good point I'm hoping at least within the first first couple of rounds well it's just going to be so interesting to see both of them and how how they're going to read off of each other like all right here we are sparring you know, for the hundredth time or whatever time and, and see whose game plan, I guess, is going to play out better for each other. Because you know that they both just, um, excuse me, you know that they both, they're just so familiar with each other. And that's what makes this fight so interesting is, is that they've been former teammates. Right. And uh, another thing I'm also interested, in, even though I think he, he should go for a wrestling, is to see if, because the difference to me in their striking styles is Cody has more one shot power, but I think TJ does a very good um, Diaz brothers interpretation where he throws a lot of low power shots and mixes in hard shots. And Mm -hmm. I think that's why people think TJ Dillashaw doesn't have a lot of power, but I think he does. I just think that he does so good a job of throwing changeups, throws a lot of changeups and then he mixes in a fastball and you don't see it coming. But that head movement, Cody Garbrandt's head movement is so... Awesome. And so yeah. when you're throwing a lower power shot, they're obviously faster. So there could also be a strategy where TJ just goes in there and just tries to touch Cody, mm-hmm. just tries to touch him, throwing those change ups, throwing the change ups and kind of annoy Cody. And obviously, as you said, there's a lot of anger with these two. And when right. you throw a lot of annoying shots at someone, they're going to get angry. And that could maybe force Cody, a younger guy, uh, to get really revved, maybe even more revved up than he already is make a mistake and then that's when tj throws the fastball and he's like whoa where did that come from (laughs) so you also have that too uh and and i really think it's in best fighter both fighters interest to not get too revved up because i think the fighter that gets more revved up is gonna get hurt and is gonna get finished i I think that's a fact yeah no i completely agree shall we uh, any more comments here I was going to say, we get to the main event. A... Uh, we got a question here from Lewis. He wants uh, some thoughts on one of the undercard fights here with uh, Joe Duffy. He's going to be taking on James Vick. Mm, um, that's I think a that's popular very, fight. That's going to be the FS1 prelim headliner. This one's going to be very interesting. You have a guy who I think is a, a pretty good grappler in mm-hmm. Joe Duffy, um, but you're taking on a guy who's Arguably the biggest 155er in the UFC. Um, he's five inches taller than Joe Duffy. I think he's 6'3", mm-hmm. um, if I interpret that correctly, and has a 76-inch reach uh, and absolutely throws super hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I really think it's going to be, can Joe Duffy get on the inside to take this fight to the ground? Because I think if it goes to the ground, I would say Joe Duffy is the more accomplished uh, grappler standing up I would say it's a little more 50 50 Joe Duffy's maybe more technical but that power of James Vick is if incredible he gets caught, yeah no that's from what I like to research in this fight too I think that was the the main point there is is the power and size going to be on Vick's side if Duffy can get him gr- on the ground I think then it's his game um but yeah like you said it's a matter of if he can get him down and, and you know get him down to his his game and his level 
All right, well, let's get to the main event here of UFC 217. Michael Bisbang against George St. Pierre. I heard someone say the undisputed uh, middleweight championship, but it's not. It actually is the disputed middleweight championship. <laughs> you have an interim champion out there in Robert Whitaker. So this is for the disputed <laughs> middleweight championship here in Madison Square Garden as uh, George St. Pierre returns, the former welterweight champion, after last fighting in the UFC almost exactly four years ago, uh, winning a close split decision over Johnny Hendricks. And in that time, it's not only that he's been away from the sport, Kayla, but also he went through a very serious ACL injury, too. Right. So that is another factor to look at, not just cage rush, but how is that leg going to hold up, especially against the guy that throw, likes to throw quite a bit of leg kicks and Michael Bisbing. Um, and Michael Bisbing, he has been out of action for a while, too. Uh, he has not fought since uh, defeating Dan Henderson, and that was almost a year ago in October. And obviously, Michael Bisbing's not getting any younger. He's now 38 years old. Um, how will that affect him? Because obviously, in the last couple of fights, we've seen Bisbing start to show signs of aging, uh, especially in you look at his fight against Talis Leites and Anderson Silva. Um, wouldn't that be wouldn't that, wouldn't that be something if him deciding to wait on this GSP fight ended up just burning him? keeping him out of the out of the octagon that would be pretty interesting if we saw him have a little bit of um... i mean it could i always i always look at that if, if you haven't basically if you haven't done your job for a year i think that's a big deal i don't care when it happened i don't care if you're in the prime of your career i don't care if you're towards the end of your career or at the beginning if all you've been doing is practicing your job that's not the same thing uh -huh. <laughs> it's not i can practice a lot here at, at being a, a broadcaster and being a host but i haven't done it it's not the same thing it, it right. just isn't and so while yeah michael bisming's a professional yeah this will be his 38th professional fight he's also had boxing fights and all these other muay thai and kickboxing fights but it's still not the same and you also have to add in i think all the pressures on him too i think this yeah. is really the first time probably since his Talos Leite's fight, which that was almost two years ago, that he's been expected to win a fight. <laughs> um, because I don't think anyone picked him. I think a lot of people didn't pick him to be Anderson Silva, didn't pick him to beat Luke Rockhold in the rematch, and didn't yeah. pick him to beat Dan Henderson in the rematch. <laughs> so he's coming into, I think, kind of a, a weird territory where he's like the overdog, and people are expecting him to win. And I think there's also something to be said for that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, not that he's someone that with experience obviously has been able to show that he can take on this pressure and, and become champion. But I think that's what's amazing is this is a fight, obviously, for those those MMA fans and MMA fans that have been around for a while. It's funny. I'm dealing with a cat here at my on my end. The animals want to join in on, on our MMA I'm curious talk. right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, so – GSP, he's he's someone who's like many people. I'm sure many of you guys too. Just made me such a fan of the sport. Got me invested in the sport. So I'm so excited, like everybody, for his comeback. I think what's interesting about him is out of a lot of these older guys that have decided to like come back, whether it be in Bellator or the UFC, he's someone that I think has always known that the sport's evolving and always kind of like paid attention to that and not necessarily like gone back into the sport thinking like, well, I was once champion. Like I don't need to do my homework and continue evolving as a mixed martial artist. I think he's really taken that, um, you know, to heart that if he's going to come back, he needs to be training with the old and new, um, you know, people in the sport. I think that it's really interesting. He's thrown in different, uh, type of sports or different types of workout routines like gymnastics. Who knows if things like gymnastics, um, break dancing, like Tony Ferguson's doing, maybe those outside elements of, uh, you know, practicing things that are outside of mixed martial arts are keys that are going to come in and help, you know, these new MMA uh, champions evolve. But I think that he's someone who just hasn't underestimated where the sport's going. And I think that he's really done his homework there. So I'm expecting to see a GSP that's just another evolved version of himself. I do think that, like you're saying, with that injury of the ACL, Michael Bisping's a very smart fighter. He's going to know that he can try and capitalize on that. 
obviously he's champion for a reason. He's no one to sleep on, you know, sleep on either. He has um, all of the capabilities that he has. And, and like you said, a lot of pressure to go in there and perform as champion and, and outstrike George. But I think that I'm, I'm seeing that I'm feeling that maybe George has done more homework as far as um, stepping up and evolving his game, his, his full around uh, mixed martial arts game. Yeah, George St. Pierre is a true martial artist, and that's not to take away anything from Michael Bisbing, but Michael Bisbing is a fighter, and George St. Pierre is a martial artist. I, mm -hmm. I would say that that's the biggest difference between these two. And while he's been away, yeah, it's not like he's just been sitting on his couch, he, but he, he did have that major injury. Um, you mentioned break dancing and stuff like that. He also has done some spending some time with my favorite kickboxer in Raymond Daniels, a guy who uh, comes from a point karate background and a guy that just won Bellator's kickboxing championship. And that guy is an incredible guy to learn from uh, in the realm of karate and, and striking arts. Uh, that is an incredible guy to learn from. I've interviewed him many times, and I've learned a lot just talking with him 30 minutes. So I can only imagine oh. doing several training sessions with the guy. <laughs> so I think from that standpoint, he's definitely going to be prepared. He comes from a coach with Fariz who's very detail-oriented. So as far as game plan and preparation – he's going to be very prepared for what he wants to do in this matchup. And I don't think it's going to be what's possibly going to hold him up though. It's just going to be the size and power as much as martial arts and technique and leverage and stuff can work for you. And it can, but strength and power can sometimes win out despite all that technique and leverage. And Michael Bisbing is a guy that is a pretty big middleweight, a uh, pretty okay. solid guy. He definitely walks around over 200 pounds um, GSP is walking around, I think even at his heaviest, wasn't weighing more than 190. Mm -hmm. and, and as far as I know, he wasn't really walking around more than 185 pounds. So he's, right. he's already at 185. He's not, he's not cutting down. That's just what he is. Bisbing is going to have at least 20 to 25 pounds on him. I think that's a huge difference. And also, Stuart St. Pierre has never been a guy who's knocking people out. Mm -hmm. the, so you would think, oh, so there's not really to me – power to translate those shots bisbing's taken some of the best shots from anybody i mean go back and watch the anderson silva fight look at the shots he took against anderson silva even look at luke rockhold the first uh, fight he took at he's taken on kung lee he's taken on vitor belfort you know he's taken on brian stan um sexy yama vanderlei silva dan henderson um <laughs> you know he's yeah he got knocked out in some of those fights but but by I would say I those shots, yeah. nothing GSP is throwing, though, is going to be harder than any of those guys. You, know, you don't you know think what with think? Freddie Roach? Training with Freddie Roach, maybe? <laughs> I mean, that's going to help in his footwork. No, but yeah, but the that's definitely going to get more power. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, power is something that's, I, I feel like speed and power are two things you can't teach. You either have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can do things to get faster, but at the end of the day, you're either, you're either you're so fast or you either hit so hard. Uh, right, you have to be, yeah. Yeah, born it's, with that it's a weird thing like that. So when I go from that, I don't think anything George St. Pierre throws at Bisbing is going to outright hurt him with one shot. It's going to be because of accumulation of shots. Yeah. Um, now, conditioning, Michael Bisbing's always been in tremendous shape. Obviously, even though GSP is moving up a weight class, you think his conditioning would be fine. But again, as we've mentioned, Kayla, the ACL surgery, plus with being four months, away, four years away from doing your job, that's got to affect your conditioning a little bit. You, you can't say the, the same guy that exited uh, against Johnny Hendricks is going to have the same level of conditioning as the guy that's entering this fight against Michael Bisping. I feel like, I, I don't know why, I just feel like he never... And besides, I'm sure, recovering for the, from that injury, I feel like he's just always planned on coming back. That I don't think – I think compared to other guys that have maybe taken a break and come back, I don't think he completely ever stopped training like he used to. I, uh, yes, I don't know if his conditioning is going to be the same. And then because he's moving up in a different uh, you know, weight division, that goes into play too. It's just he's not used to fighting and, like you said, even walking around at, at this weight. So that's going to be a big, big uh, factor. And he hasn't had that much time to prepare and be comfortable at that weight, too, training at that weight. Now, we brought up the takedown defense stats for Ioana Jacek, And over the course of fighting in the UFC for 10-plus years, Michael Bisbing has been a guy, I would say, is that has been hard to take down. Really, the only fight I can really remember a guy continually take him down was the Tim Kennedy fight. 
um, mm. which really surprised me how well Tim Kennedy was able to control Michael Bisping. And I think that was one of the fights that kind of really took down Michael Bisping's takedown defense, which as of right now stands at 64% in his career. So on paper, that doesn't look like a great 64. You would say, oh, well, GSP, of course, will be able to take down Michael Bisping. It's going to be a big difference. Taking down guys in welterweight, which uh, so far his accuracy is 74%, is going to be different than taking down guys at 185 pounds. And again, I hate to keep on saying the injury, but knees are a big part of taking people down. Yeah, it was a and big injury. It's not working quite the same way it was, planting, twisting, moving. It's going to be a little different taking things down. So he may have to adjust the way he shoots that double leg. He shoots that single leg. He goes in those scrambles to make sure he doesn't hurt his knee again. Yeah, no, all valid points. I think that, yeah, if anything, I think that's really going to be the big factor here is him moving up to this division. Obviously the layoff on both guys just kind of, we're going to, we're going to be able to see where is GSP at. What, and, and really he's taking a gamble. I mean, I know so many things have been said, Oh, if I lose this fight, then I really am going to retire. Uh, who knows if any, or if he's going to go down to try and fight Tyron, uh, Tyron Woodley, all these things are being thrown out there, and who knows what until after the fight happens what the what the truth is and what GSP's plan is. But I think that um, you know for a comeback, this was, and that's something that I also too just want to commend in him is coming back and taking a chance of moving up to 185. That right there alone, um, you know, is is just a gamble. I guess is what I'm trying to say. It is. And also, I remember, I think it might have been Chael Sonnen that, that said this. Anytime you already are thinking about retirement, or in GSP's case, have mm -hmm. actually retired, your head's not quite where it was as a fighter, too. It, right. It's just not the same. You have a much different mindset, because he's already had, he was already out the door. <laughs> he's oh, already man, out the you're door, making me, you're they, making me almost feel like I should change in. my prediction. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I think you got to be, for a guy that I always would consider a very mentally strong individual, for the first time ever, I think you have to question his head a little bit just because, you know, wh where is it at? Is this just a fight to get money? Is this just a fight to, to prove how, like, badass he is? Uh -huh. uh, is this just something he just always wanted to do? You know, I, I don't know. It, it's it's kind of weird to see his motivations. We all see what Michael Bisbing's motivation is. One, <laughs> he, he gets what assumes to be an easier fight. Two, he gets a bigger payday. And three, he, his popularity and prestige, like that guy's thinking about calling him the go, that grows too. It's mm -hmm. all positives from a lot of positives for Michael Bisping, you know? <laughs> so I, I, we all see why Michael Bisping's taking it. But really, when you look at GSP, you think, realistically, why is he taking this fight? Like, yeah. like seriously. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's what, it's just going to be so telling just to see where both guys' heads are at. You know, because even Michael Bisping's talked about retirement after this fight, and now he's saying, no, I will, you know, go and continue to face Robert Whitaker and, and continue to fight on. But, um, yeah, a very, very good main event just to see if we get a potential GOAT, or if you already want to call GSP the GOAT, um, a comeback. And, and it will. It will give, um, obviously, just add to Michael Bisping's resume, resume. And what I was saying earlier is he's built a legacy within himself. And like you said, to have a win over GSP, whether it be in his prime or not, is something that I know I would brag about to my friends. <laughs> All right, we got one question I want to get to before we get to our predictions here. Uh, Lewis asked another question. Would you rather be 10 minutes late or 20 <laughs> minutes early? Uh, always early. Never late. I don't care whether it's one minute late. I will always choose early because I, I hate being late. I hate other people being late. It's one of my mm -hmm. biggest pet peeves uh, as a person. I get visibly upset when I'm late to something. So, yeah, always 20 minutes early. Lewis, thank you for throwing in these fun questions. <laughs> I also um, choose to be t or prefer to be 10 minutes early. I, I, I as well just think that it's um, – in poor fashion to not show up, especially when you have plans with someone. And um, over time, I'm not going to lie, back in school, I was notorious for walking in the classroom late and being embarrassed for being late. I've learned my lesson. Just just prepare, time management, and get there a little early. You won't stress. You'll feel better about it. Right. 
All right, let's get to picks here for UFC 217, the main card on pay-per-view this Saturday from New York, New York at Madison Square Garden, 10 p.m. in the east, 7 in the west. Hendricks versus Paula Costo in the middleweight division. I'm going with a little bit uh, of an upset here. I'm going to go with Paula Costa. I just, as much as I'd like to believe Johnny Hendricks can return, I just don't like the way he's has been fighting lately. And a guy that I definitely question his his mental toughness right now. And I'm going to go with the young upstart Brazilian to win this one. Man, um, not that I don't think he makes some good points there. I just think that Johnny Hendricks, the way that he um, has been conducting himself this week through media. I think that he has a new mindset and I think he's going to show us some of those old skills. I think he also knows that people are going to be, um, bringing up the fight against GSP. Maybe GSP being on this card gives him a little bit of motivation. I think I'm seeing a win, uh, for Johnny Hendricks. All right, the next fight is Stephen Thompson against Jorge Masvidal in the welterweight division. I'm going Stephen Thompson. I think he Mm. will be able to create enough space and enough angles to get off that karate-style attack and be able to counter the aggressive forward-moving Jorge Masvidal. So I'm going to go with the Wonder Boy to win this one. All right, well, I'm going to go with Jorge Masvidal. I think that he's going to find a way to get past that distance, put on that pressure, kind of almost upset Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. And I just think that his composure in his last two fights has just shown that he's really coming into his own, feeling confident within his skills, and I think that's going to pull off the win for him. All right, our next fight, the first of three championship bouts in the women's strawweight division, Joanna Jacek against Rose Namajunas, and it's Joanna. That's always my pick. I'm not going against it. I'm not going to even give a breakdown for it because it's simply Joanna, and that is the pick, and that's what everyone should pick. I don't care what the money line is. That's who you put your money on. (laughs) I agree. You never go against Joanna. She's just, she's on another level. This is why Rose is probably even a better mixed martial artist is she's, they're all trying to get to Joanna's caliber, and I think that we're going to see, again, I'm predicting fight of the night, I just think that it's going to add to Joanna's skills as far as how much of a, uh, of a champion she is that she can defend against the stuff that Rose is going to be throwing at her. Cody Garbrandt against TJ Dillashaw for the Bantamweight Championship. I'm going with the Ohio guy, Cody Garbrandt here. Mm. I just think that doing what he did to Dominic Cruz was such an incredible performance And I think despite he did have a little bit of an injury, one of the reasons this fight is delayed and happening in November as opposed to happening uh, this past summer, uh, it wasn't so big injury. I think it's going to hamper him at all in this matchup. But I just think that this kid uh, has figured things out uh, with his team there uh, in Sacramento. And I think he's going to be able to to get past Maybe I, it's hard to say his toughest test, but definitely a very tough test um, in TJ Dillashaw. But I'm going to go uh, hashtag and still. On this one. <laughs> I agree with you on this one, too. I'm really hoping that one of them walks out to Taylor Swift bad blood or some <laughs> sort of like <laughs> some sort of bad blood song there. Maybe that wouldn't be the best one for them, but that'd be hilarious. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you. I think that Cody. He's just this new, evolved mixed martial artist. I think that, yes, like you said, this is going to be one of his toughest tests. But just with, again, his performance with Dominic Cruz, I think that he has a slightly um, slightly more edge of skills. And I just don't think that he's going to let his emotions get in there. I don't think his te- uh, team and coaches will let his emotions get the best of him. So I also am going with hashtag and still. All right, Michael Bisbang against George St. Pierre for the disputed middleweight championship of the UFC. And I'm going with the disputed champion, Michael Bisbang, in this one. I just think that his size is just a huge difference in this fight. Even though he's been out 11 months, he's still the more active fighter than George St. Pierre at four years. And also, he's not moving up a weight class. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just think that Michael Bisbang will be able to stop the majority of the takedowns keep the fight standing, use, again, those punches and bunches, that great strategy that he has, throwing a lot of, uh, very similar to TJ Dillashaw, throws a lot of, uh, you know, change-ups and mixes in the fastballs very well. And I think GSP, despite being such a great martial artist, I think the layoff, the size difference, I think is going to be very tough for him uh, to combat in this one. So I'm going to go with Michael Bisping. 
My heart just can't bet against GSP. I want to be a believer, although you put up very good facts and a very good argument there. I just think that, like myself, so many other mixed martial artists want to see him come back. I think he's been training with some of the best people in all forms of mixed martial artists and then some. So I'm going to predict an upset um, and also another hashtag uh, and new champion. Or I guess returning champion now. Right, for Vision. sure. Um, <laughs> once again, I am Jim Graham. She is Kayla Beatty. We're uh, live here on MMA World. Um, like the page right now, MMA World uh, with three Ds. Uh, like it today uh, for all these great videos and interviews and previews and all that. And you can also follow us on Twitter at MMA World um, with two days, two Ds. Uh, my personal Twitter is at Jim Graham. It's just my name at Jim Graham, J-I-M-G-R-A-M-M. -M. And uh, Kayla is on Twitter at fangirl underscore MMA, correct? Yep, that's correct. All right. Um, so thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks to everybody that commented. Again, sorry for the technical difficulties for the desktop viewers to start the show. It looks as though that fix, fixed itself out. I actually pulled it up on my browser and was able to watch it. So um, thank you for everybody for, for checking the show out. Uh, there will be a recap of UFC 217, uh, I believe, on Sunday here on MMA World, and hope everybody enjoys the fights on Saturday. So uh, for Kayla Beatty, I'm your host, Jim Graham. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and we'll catch you next time.